go. And um, I'm pleased to announce that we've got Gil Anotsman. Of course, people have seen him earlier today, or for the new people, here he is. And he has uh, visited <laughs> Portland many times, starting in 2009, and he's always been controversial. And finally, we've got, uh, you know, the whole reason we had to relocate here was because opponents uh, of uh, the truth started, like, bombarding with threats, and they caved quickly, but fortunately, we so we were able to pivot. <laughs> and um, it actually, it, it makes me flash back big time, because, of course, Back in the 9-11 days, you know, when we were doing truth events, suddenly, the minute we started talking about Israel, all hell broke loose. Yeah. And, you know, we, the, the, the group started being infiltrated, the events started being doxxed, and, you know, we started out meeting at the Friends Meeting House on 43rd and Stark. I mean, you know, we were, I, was, I, was, I had a long relationship with the Friends. And it all got blown up by uh, these attacks and you know gradually they like chased us out of the core of Portland and, and we kind of like laid low and we were even in parks and they chased us there. And cemetery. Cemetery, we, we did, we were in fact. You did cemeteries? We met in cemeteries. Wow, man. We were meeting in cemeteries and I actually love cemeteries, so. Yeah, you will, you will, you will spend quite a bit of yeah, time there yeah. and, eventually. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. The what? The Jewish cemetery. We met in the Jewish cemetery. Really? No. Really? We met in the Pioneer Cemetery. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> so here we are, still still fighting the fight, and uh, Phil is going to talk about you know Gaza, what's happening in Gaza, what's going on with Jewish identity, and, and he's going to lay it on us. And I'm what is this Jewish it. identity that everybody speaks about now? Yeah, what is yeah. it now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and um, we have books and CDs for sale, and if you buy two for 30, you get a third thing free. And if you buy 1,000, you get a kiss. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, those who have seen me before probably remember I'm kind of slow when I start, and then I get excited by my own ideas, and then it's, you'll probably find out that it's mutually exciting. Um, normal society, in a normal society, truth doesn't need a movement. You probably agree with that. In America, we have truth movement. And it doesn't help. We are in trouble. Yeah. We are in trouble. And we will try to uh, elaborate today on the conditions and the strategies that deviate us from truth and truthfulness. I'll throw a few insights. The French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard produced a great insight about history. He realized that history presents itself as an attempt to tell us what happened, but in practice, it hardly ever doing just that. What it does usually, it is basically an institutional attempt to conceal our shame. So, ah, huh? it's interesting. You're in the right place. Yeah. So, for instance, when you look at American history, some people have been investing quite a lot of energy 
to concealing what you did to Native Americans. A lot of energy is invested in the concealment of the embarrassing fact that in the last 100 years there wasn't one year that you didn't, I say you, but you know, I don't mean you personally, America, didn't drop bombs on innocent people. A lot of, a lot of concealment was invested in an attempt to cover the real reasons for uh, nuking Nagasaki Hiroshima. But Americans are not alone. The Brits have the same problem. They have a lot of past they don't feel comfortable with. Massacres, famine, a lot to hide. They are very much like the Americans. What the Americans do they, when they don't know what, how to deal with their own past? They build Holocaust museums. This is a very clever thing to do. Because one of the things that people, Americans, are embarrassed about the Holocaust is the fact that America closed its gates to Jews. You know, so from 33 to 45, Jews can, could hardly come to this country. They were sent back. Interestingly enough, this is one of the stories that you won't find in the Holocaust Museum. What the Brits do with the past? They build Holocaust Museums. We had in, in London, I don't know, maybe you saw it, it's a kind of a big London attraction. We have, uh, it is called the Imperial Wars Museum. When I came to London, it was one of the most incredible museums. Now they left kind of a few tanks in the main room. They made all the rest into a Holocaust museum. The Holocaust got nothing to do with British imperial nonsense. In fact, if anything, the Brits are complicit in the destruction of European Jewry because, and I don't argue about it, there are good arguments for why they did it. They closed um, Palestine in 39. They could see that Palestine is becoming a mess. They closed their gates to European Jews and so on and so on. They just took some kids. And the Brits always do the same, you know, like Syria. It was them who destroyed Syria and ISIS and, and then the Brits, there was a wave of immigration and the Brits said, we will take a few kids. Orphans, they really like orphans. I don't want to think why. You obviously don't know enough about British aristocracy. <laughs> anyway, what about the Jews? The Jews have a lot to cover. When you look at Jewish history, it's a chain of Holocaust with a few coffee breaks. The Jews have to invest a lot of energy turning in the other way around so they never look at themselves, look what are the problems within their culture that bring all these disasters. So it's always the going, you people, you, you don't behave, not, no, I don't, I don't really mean it. But they always blame the going, the Gentiles. Anti-Semite, 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 anti-Semite. Tonight I was an anti-Semite as well. You know, it's, it's, I am used to it. And what about the Palestinians? You, you, have, you, have, you have a lot to conceal as well, if you don't mind me saying. You know, because when you look at Palestine, and by the way, this app changed in the last two months for me. If you look at Palestine, you see 100 years of endless battle, and they didn't manage to progress an inch. Do you mind me saying it? So you need to build a historical narrative that conceals the fact that you are useless. It's awful, I know. I'm sorry about it. We can analyze why it is, and I'll, I'll get there, because I won't leave it like that, I promise. Okay. <laughs> well, the Jews are good writing their history and history narrative. Uh, you're right, you're but right. Media, of for sure, for sure. There are a lot of reasons. So we understand what I'm what we are talking about. So you can see that Lyotard 
wasn't completely crazy. Yeah, there is an element of truth in what he's saying. I'll tell you, I'll take it one step farther, which is not really relevant for our talk, but it's just very interesting. What he says, the real historian, the real historian, the one that is dedicated <coughs> to real historical research, works like the psychoanalyst. What he's doing, he is unveiling the shame. He is lifting those layers of nonsense that cover our shame. And these kind of historians usually are usually called the revisionists, and uh, they are controversial because they're dealing with shame. But as a principle, what we learn from Lyotard is very helpful for us already now, because when you see a narr narrative, an historical narrative, a truth narrative, 9-11, any kind of narrative, it is most of the time more interesting to look what is this narrative comes to cover, to conceal. What is the shame? Ask yourself, always, what is it, what is it that they try to hide? Don't say it's a completely different way of looking at history. Okay, we progress. So I already told you that history and past and truth basically is always suppressed. And now I will throw on you another problematic insight. As much as the truth is under attack, and you know it, in America, we are suffocated with lies. It's like it is so pathetic that we kind of listen to the news to know what isn't going to happen. <laughs> all right? It is, it is pathetic. So they tell us, uh, all right, so uh, there was a... Um, nerve attack uh, in uh, Salisbury, and uh, there is the Russians. So, oh, yeah, 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 Russian, exactly. Why, why should the Russian, you know, the Russian want to kill someone. They kill him properly. They have this umbrella, chick, and that's it. You know, they leave a trace, Novichov, Novikov, Nabukov, you know, and it goes back. Oh, what is that? What is that? They really think, they really underestimate our intelligence. It's, and then there is an attack in Duma. What attack? And then they know that they botched up the story, so they come with a, a cruise missile raid just be, a few hours before the, the fact-finding mission. Is <laughs> We see it all. The emperor is naked. Actually, well, after what I heard, maybe we don't want to see your emperor naked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, unless you are you are kind of a, a microscope or something, you know. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But there are rumors, kind of. Uh, this is the one thing that he really doesn't like people to. And I'm not going to talk about it. It's rumors. Uh, we have to erase it. Uh, here is an interesting thing. Despite all the efforts to deceive, to lie to us, to make us submerged in complete lies. The truth, <coughs> as this incredible tendency to unveil itself. This is very interesting, and it's quite unusual. Look at Palestine in the last two months. Look at Trump, idiotic Jerusalem embassy nonsense, moving it to Jerusalem. Do you remember what happened there? I see Trump as a corridor towards redemption. And I'm not going to talk to her as a Trump supporter, because I'm not. 
But this guy is a unique vehicle. He's from heaven. It's a, it's a nasty god up there. All right? It's not. It's not. For many, how many years we see Palestinians being drugged in the mud by the Americans who pretend to be negotiators and, and provide nothing? It's, it's decades. It took Trump this miserable Jerusalem decision. And within th three hours, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, the Palestinian president, who is not very popular in Palestine, and probably not very popular in this room, and not popular anywhere, to stand up. He's one of the weakest leaders in the world. He stood up and said, sorry, Mr. Pence, you don't come to Ramallah. The Palestinian president is a mosquito in comparison with this superpower. He showed him the finger. He told him, you don't come to Ramallah. And you Americans are not negotiators. You are side in the conflict. Thank you, Donald. He did it or not? He took Donald Trump to tell the Palestinians, you are basically screwed up. And if you really want to liberate yourself, you better start to move forward. And this is what we see now in the Gaza border. And something strange happened today, because it really happened today. I didn't investigate, but kind of some kind of a superficial look. So, so the examination suggests to me that there were a lot of concessions to Hamas today, in the, yesterday. Okay? Uh, but thanks to the Egyptian, the Egyptian were negotiating. America was panicking. Uh, America was panicking. Uh, uh, the Israelis were, they thought that they have a big victory. By, we, will, we will talk about the situation. It's, it's horrendous. I don't have to explain how disgusting it is. Let's, so for many years, the Palestinian solidarity movement was dominated by Jewish solidarity groups like JVP, like people who tried to stop us today and yesterday. <laughs> and they basically, they su support the Palestinians as long as the Palestinians want to return to their homes. The one thing that the JVPs don't like the Jewish solidarity in general is right of return. And they are very clever. They are doing this solidarity project for 2,500 uh, 2, years. I think that they used to support the Aramaic and the Persian and, uh, you know, in the Bible. So they know how to do it, how to roll this spin. The one thing that they started to do was to throw new terms. So while 25 years ago, for the Palestinians, there was one thing, right of return. Three words that says everything. Right of return means that all Palestinians are united, and the plight is clear and uh, orientated or gravitated towards the Nakba, to 1948, which is today 70 years. All right? The right of return brings light on the racist nature of Israel. Am I right? Why can't they return? Because they are not racially qualified. Now, the Jews are not race. But Jewish politics is racist. You see the difference, yeah? He cannot go to his homeland, cannot travel, and we just spoke about it, because he's not racially qualified. Sorry. This is the Jewish state that was born three days after the liberation of Auschwitz. They really learned the wrong thing from the wrong people. And they get away with it. <clears throat> Suddenly, 
the Jewish organization come into the kind of start to get involved and they invent the first notion that they invent is end of occupation and everybody oh end of occupation also three words end of occupation and three words great nobody notices at the time that end of occupation actually is legitimization of the Jewish state in, in uh, it's uh, end of occupation is end to the right of return and then they start to talk about colonialism, apartheid, apartheid, colonialism, settler colonialism, all those terms. I said, what? Well, you know, I'm not an historian, but I'm a thinking human being. I'm a philosopher. So I have this tendency to look on all these issues terminologically, essentially. What is colonialism? Israel is not colonialism. Colonialism is a clear material exchange between a mother state and a settler state. Israel is a settler state. Where is mommy? There is no mommy. I mean, I know where is my mommy, but, but Israel doesn't have a mommy. And if the, it has a mother, it's a surrogate mother. It was the, the Turks and then the Brits and then the French and now America and probably Putin is the next. This is, this is something, this is a very, no, 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 no. If we can, the, it's a good point, because if we look, not just the Rothschild, if the Jewish entity, the Jewish people, is the mother, is the family, then we can look at it as a colonialism, but then the mother state, the Jews, are responsible for everything, and this is exactly what JBP don't want to do. All right? So I'm happy with it, but this is not why they invented colonialism. So it's not colonialism. When you come to a place and say, sorry, um, do you mind to move? He said, why? I, I, I've been here 2,000 years ago. <laughs> it's quite an unusual argument, huh? <laughs> according to that argument, sorry, according, according to that argument, every, every Italian can come to my house in London and take it. Because the Roman ancestors have uh, been there before. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, if you got back to the Canaanites, yeah. they were before ever. For sure. Wait, will the Canaanites come and take it from the Jews? This will be... Uh, <laughs> all right, I, I'm, I'm making it very quickly, you know, and then they start to talk about colonialism. What colonialism? You know, it's like... Uh, about apartheid. About apartheid. Apartheid is a racist system of... Ex uh, a racist system of, uh, of exploitation. They don't want to exploit the Palestinians. They want them out. It's an ethnic cleanser. Why do they come with colonialism and apartheid? Because they want to make sure that you people think that there is nothing unique about the Jewish state. It's like Britain and Dutch colonialism and uh, South Africa. No, it's a very unique system. They want us to be confused by it. Not, and this is, this is a project that is taken care of by uh, major uh, Jewish uh, academics, even people like Ilan, pa Ilan Pape, who is, a, is, a, is the head of the Palestinian, uh, um, in Palestinian Institute in Exeter University. Even he is not genuine enough to deal with these issues. You know, he's a, maintaining this terminological mess. Okay, we have a lot of enemies for truth, and then against all odds and this terminological terminological nonsense Donald Trump moves the embassy to Jerusalem and three weeks later Palestinians start to talk about the right of return since 30th of March we have demonstration every weekend and then we start to see once again the truth of the Jewish state what is the truth of the Jewish state why Zionism was, came to the world? Zionists, and Zionism, I'm not going to talk to you as an anti-Zionist. I'm a pro-Zionist. Zionism came to the world as a unique moment where the Jews, a few Jews, few Jewish intellectuals, major intellectuals, admit that there is something uniquely wrong about the Jews. They say, 
look at us. Everybody hates us. Is it their fault? No, it's our fault. All our history is a chain of disaster. Is it the going fault? It's our fault. It's because we are chosen knights. We believe in our chosenness and we don't mix with other people. And we are bunkers and we are usurers. This is not me and this is not Hitler. These are the early Zionists, especially the labor Zionists. And Bear Bochop said, every society looks like that, like a pyramid. You have a lot of working class and farmers and peasants, simple people, and then you have a few bourgeoisies, doctors, lawyers, and a bit of aristocracy, yeah? He said, when you look at the Jewish society, it looks like that. Maybe there is one guy, uh, kind of a peasant, you know. <laughs> there are a lot, of, a lot of doctors, and all the rest are bankers. He said, we take this society, we come to Palestine and we start to build ourselves as a nation, as a normal nation. They say, we are going to make the Jews people like all other people. When I was a student in Israeli school, people like all other people, and you see Herzl. All right? This guy, this guy with the beard and the syphilis. We didn't talk about syphilis, but he was, uh, yeah? <laughs> anyway, they came to Palestine. They did it. Professors, doctors, bankers became bricklayers and peasants and factory workers for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> then they found out that the Palestinians were cheaper. And by the way, and then they had a big debate, the big debate on Jewish labor which is a debate that I even remember it when I was a young kid in a kibbutz. So Zionism came to change the Jews, to make them people like all other people, to reinvent them into something else. And this week, we are looking this week, yesterday. How did they manage to injure 1,000 Palestinians? No, 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 I know. 2,000 Palestinians, 1,000 around us with live ammunition. These are people, these are people who are shooting one by one. These are snipers, the targets, Human beings. What country put snipers against protesters? No, if you have protesters, you put unarmed policemen. Am I right? This is how you do it. You put unarmed policemen, and maybe you have some kind of um, special policemen in the back. They put tanks and soldiers against and drones. All right? Military force against protesters, most of them kids. This is the truth of the Jewish state. What people put it? People who have zero respect to otherness. What kind of people will lock the indigenous people of the land? In an open air prison, the Jewish state. Is this people like all other people? No. No, unfortunately. It's people like no other people. So here we are, thanks to Donald Trump, we have an opportunity to see the truth of the Jewish state. And this is, this is very, very important. And now I'm going to another French guy. I don't know why I'm always thinking, to, I, I don't even speak French, and I don't like France. <laughs> the French Revolution, exactly. You know, and look where we are now. You know, this is the invented the individuality is about a mess. 
אוקיי. There is a great, I mean, I like him, but I'm pretty much alone. <laughs> French philosopher, Jacques Lacan. Jacques Lacan said that the unconscious is the discourse of the other. Now, the thing about Jacques Lacan, nobody understands. When he speaks, nobody understands until uh, um, Zizek, a uh, contemporary philosopher, decided, and we don't even know if he, he, he understood Lacan, but we, 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 like, we like Lacan through Zizek. This is a very important thing. Unconscious is the discourse of the other. What does it mean? It means a lot. It means that the unconscious is the fear that the people out there see me truly. And actually, we discussed these issues in the, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. We are coming now to anti-Semitism. It's the fear that you know that thing that I try to conceal, even from myself. It's frightening. So if I, let's make it kind of a libidinal thing. If I had the experience with a lady last night, and I really, I really didn't, uh, it was a disaster. Which is, oh, you, you know, it's, for me it's kind of normal, but, but uh, so, so it's not a good example, but uh, let's say that usually I function, and then I had a, a, a disastrous case, you know, with a woman, and now I'm coming to a party, and I'm kind of a big Abu Ali, you know, and, uh, and then I see her in the room, and she's talking to 12 of her girlfriends. I said, oh, fuck, oh, you know, you know. And then they talk about, I don't know, they just a uh, recipe how to make, I don't know, uh, bacon with cheese. I don't know what women talk about, you know. But uh, it's the fear. And this is exactly why the Jewish universe, the Zionist universe, the anti-Zionist, all of them, all the people who identify politically as Jews, are in a state of total is nostalgia. So Trump understood it. Hitler understood it. Uh, and I understand it. You know, try to see three, three powerful elements in history. OK? But Trump also did something. You have to go. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Trump did something else. Trump, in his entire, according to the Jewish press, in his entire campaign, targeted the Jews in what they call dog whistling. This is what the Jews were saying. His last, if you remember his last ad, he put kind of a, a, a what was the, what who was it? It uh, was uh, Janet Yellen, uh, George Soros, the Federal Reserve, and it was say, uh, he's targeting us, it's a dog whistling. What is dog whistling? Dog whistling, it means that your enemies hear these frequencies that they and Trump understand, and you also see it. So there is no dog whistling. Everybody sees it. All right? When they say dog whistling, they say everybody know, including ourselves and our enemies, know that something is wrong. Why Trump was elected? Because America is tired. And it's, you're not the only one. Before Trump was elected, there was a referendum in Scotland. And the Scotland was, were always also tired. And then we had Brexit. I think it was before Trump. And 51% of, of the Brits are tired. And the right is rising because people are tired. Let's talk about this fatigue. Because we can talk about Palestine, but the whole idea of this talk 
And this is a major insight for me. Because I was the guy who coined the, we are all Palestinians. But it took me two weeks to understand that we are all Palestinians because like the Palestinians, we are not allowed to utter the name of our oppressor. And you mentioned USS Liberty. I had a radio interview with the USS Liberty radio. They have a radio show now on rents.com. And I said, I was, I'm the one who coined, we are all Palestinians. I said, we are all, we are all liberty, USS Liberty. And I thought about it. Yes, to start with, we are sinking. We are attacked. We are plundered. We are hijacked. And look at, look at it, 35 years now, and we cannot talk about it. All right, so it's the same thing. Palestine, liberty, is the same thing. There is one difference. <coughs> the reason that we couldn't talk about USS Liberty is because it was very embarrassing. It's quite embarrassing that your ally country, you know, Israel, is really working hard to sink one of your vessels and then American pilots are sent to rescue and they're called back. What is all this story? It's embarrassing. It stinks. But there was still shame. In 1967, in 1970s, 80s, 90s, there was still shame in the American society. Politicians understood that such acts should be concealed. But yesterday, in the embassy, who represented America? What is the name of the American ambassador to Israel? This settler, Greenblatt, Greenblatt. Right. Huh? No, 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 he's a, he's a settler Jew. And Kushner. When is the last time American was represented by this kind of people? In an official gathering. The truth is coming. Out. So as you can see, I'm one of the most optimistic creatures around. I think we just have to sit and to let it all unveil itself. But we have problems. We have problems. And this is now, I'm probably, some of you heard me last year and some of you read Being in Time. So I'm sorry about it because I probably repeat myself, but it's but I want to kind of uh, at this moment kind of to to start to conclude, and we we will have uh, questions, which is way more interesting for me. When you try to understand how is it possible that the universe around us has collapsed, has deteriorated rapidly. We are more or less, all of us, the same age. Some of you are older than me, but uh, I think that we are all kind of 45, 50 plus. Yeah? Thank you. You're yeah. No, we have, we have, uh, yeah, yeah. Huh? 40, 40, 40. I was fucking, I, ah, very good. And Liberty, and my name is USS, you know? <laughs> so we can do something, you know? Um, <laughs> anyway, at a certain stage, so maybe you are, you, are, you are maybe too young to remember it, but in the 70s, there wa things were not right, but there was kind of hope that we knew how to do things. We saw ourselves as people with wills, with whims, and it got to the point that some people like uh, Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, saw that we really reached the end of history. We know how to do things right. The liberal democracy. What a moron. <laughs> you know, bestseller moron. Best-selling moron. The thing is that when Francis Fukuyama wrote about it, and I speak about it in being in time, we were already on the slope. Done. We were already, we were already being, we were reduced into consumers. 
and by now we are nothing but consumers. The politicians also, they used to be the people who take care of health, education, and manufacturing. Now, the only thing that they do is producing uh, credit so we can continue to consume. They're basically facilitating this nonsense. How did it happen to us? All of that without academia telling us, that, telling us that something is wrong, without our politicians, without the left presenting kind of a dissent. What about the media, CNN? All of them in a state of paralysis. In fact, I believe that I'm the first one to produce these issues from a philosophical point of view. That some people did it kind of from an economy perspective and a historical perspective. I think that you'll see what is my analysis. I looked into it and I realized that there were two elements that were entrenched, that were planted in our society by means of cultural 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 manipulation these elements were political correctness and identity politics identity politics a disaster by the way the people who try to stop us today are identitarians i'm not against the identitarians i'm against the paradigm and i'll explain you what i mean when we were young, the left was a very simple concept. They said, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or Palestinian, gay, they were not trans. I don't know, they, they had to decide. My man, now, now it is. By the way, I'm not against it. I myself, I'm what you call a um, queer lesbian. <laughs> because because I, I, really, I really like women, but I'm locked in this kind of alpha male. Uh, it's, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. So uh, feel sorry for me, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I'm kind of also an identitarian to a certain extent. <laughs> All right. So we were together looking after each other somehow through labor movement and so on and so on. Suddenly, the left changed direction. They taught us to, teach, to speak as a, as a woman, as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a black, as a Puerto Rican, as a, wo as a woman. As, uh, a as a man is not, uh, not allowed. <laughs> uh, as a man is not allowed, as a white is not allowed, you know. Uh, and in the book, I kind of really elaborate on it. But what happened, and I make it very short, instead of fighting together, you start to fight each other. We don't have work. We have kids that don't have a reason to wake up in the morning. Instead of talking about that, we are talking about gay marriage. Who gives a fuck about I don't. I, I, I'm not against it. I'm really not interested. Who gives a fuck about every time I come to America in the last four, 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 five years, it's, you all, all you discuss is a uh, it's transgender toilets. For fuck's sake. Your health system is done, gone. Your education system is not existent. And you all you do about trans poo poo. <laughs> you know, mature state. You know, and I came, I came, I, I thought maybe, maybe, I, because I want to help, you know, I'm a foreigner, so I see things differently. Why not the trans, and we can rotate it every week. They do the we in the male and the poo poo in the female, <laughs> and just and then every week, you know, we, we <laughs> you see, you see, this is a Jewish mind, Talmudic mind, you know, it's like always trying to resolve kind of. No, no, I'm serious now. You have serious problems in this country. To start with, <laughs> your your president is pushing for a World War Three. It's slightly more serious than trans poo poo's issues. Why we were divided? What well, you, you asked me about 
Istanbul, about uh, Turkey. I spent two weeks in, in, Istanbul, in Turkey. It was very interesting because I spent one week in Istanbul, which is a very modern city, very unique, um, very mixed. And then I spent another week in Anatolia in a book fair. And this was, sorry, we have to. Ah, ah OK. So we'll have more air. Well, yeah. yeah. About what? Is what? Somebody is talking about they want to play it. Music? Anyway. Okay, we're okay. Yeah. So I asked the Turkish, I asked, I, I'm, 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 I'm talking about Turkey because I'm bringing it to you. I asked that, you know, Turkey is really divided and they have election now. And they are divided pretty much in the middle between religious, and seculars. And as the Turkish, you know, people, I met many intellectuals and artists, and I said, is there any leader who speaks about you as a nation? And the answer is no. And it's very tragic, because they're living together in the same street, in the same cities, and there is not a single element that unites the people and they need this unification because they are in a very uh, they are on a very serious junction with the situation in Syria and uh, Kurdistan the Kurds or whatever Russia is becoming a dominant force what about you is there anyone who speaks America no you are split in the middle and you're basically, the split in America is between the Americans, people who see themselves primarily as Americans, and they, I would allow myself, voted for Trump. I don't think that, not necessarily will vote for him again, some of them. And they... Uh, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. By the way, I, maybe if I were an American, I would vote for him then. Because I would never give my vote. I probably wouldn't vote, but I would never give my vote to, to Hillary Clinton. Oh, no. All right? OK, so we understand. And the other half of the Americans are the as a people. As a woman, as a Puerto Rican. As, in terms of, of demography, they, they, they may even be similar. Many of the Americans are Puerto Ricans and gays and black and Muslims and maybe not many Jews. The few, the three Jews that were in, in Trump, they are now Kushner, Schmushner, and Bushner, you know, <laughs> and they are already in the, all right? And the identitarians. And this is exactly how you do it. In America, it's not enough to break you into Democrat and Republicans. We break you into total fragments. Even the idiotic alt-right is falling into the same trap talking as white, as a white person. You identify with your biology. In fact, this situation in America now is ideal for somebody in the right or in the left to come and say, listen, the most important things are education, work, manufacturing, and health. It doesn't matter if you are gay or trans or, or uh, white. Or, you still have to wake up in the morning and you need a reason. And this is the next phase. This is the next phase. We are now in a post-political condition. The next phase is that phase. But this, this phase can take us into fascism and in, can, it tell, can take us into something that is slightly more egalitarian. So I cannot, uh, this is hard to predict. But the most important question, how did it happen to us that nobody spoke about it? It all happened in front of our eyes and we didn't understand. Why should I come first and talk about it, really? Because of political correctness. What is political correctness? Political correctness is, you heard it many, whether it is Hitler or Stalin or Theresa May. 
in political correctness, it's yourself. It's yourself. You teach yourself how not to say things, next, how not to think things, and eventually how not to think at all. There is a reason why you are suffocated with zombie films. Hollywood is always training you to get adapted to your next phase. You, you are zombies now. I mean, not my crowd, because you seem <laughs> thinking people, but we were zombified. I think that once again, Trump, being who he is and what he is, brings all of that to light. To sum all of it together, and we are really coming now to the final point, I realized that when we try to understand what happened to us, it can be summarized into two words. And this is what I do in this book. And I expect you all to have it. And if you have it, you buy another one and you give it to someone because I have a legal cost to deal with. No, no, I'm serious. This is the best way. This is what I feel most comfortable if people buy my books and ideally more than one. And then I feel that I'm not just taking your money. I leave you with something that is deeper than thoughts. I don't know if there is anything deeper than thoughts. Athens and Jerusalem, this is what it comes down to. Athens is the birthplace of philosophy, science, rationality, logic, logos, beauty, art. In Athens, we think things through. Through, I'll deal with it in a second. Athens and Jerusalem are metaphors, okay? So it's how I define it. It's not what it is in reality, okay? Because Jerusalem is the, is the city of revelation. So it's not really Jerusalem, it's Sinai. But we say Athens and Jerusalem. I didn't invent these terms. The, in, the, the guy who brought it to America is actually Leo Strauss, the guy who invented neoconservatism, by the way. Not a good guy. But he didn't invent the terms, he just brought them here, you know. Um, it's a German philosophy. Athens is where we think where things through. Jerusalem is the city of revelation. We get the truth and we have to follow it. We have to practice, we have to obey, we have to follow rules after rules after rules after rules. Rule after rule after rule after rule. It has what to do, what to do, what to do, what not to do, what not to say, what not to think, what names not to utter. Jehovah, here I did it, you in front of the camera, but, boosh, you know. <laughs> All right? Okay? The problem that we have in America is that America has been Ijacked. It's not just America, it's the entire West. Ijacked by Jerusalem. By the way, the Jerusalem is not necessarily Jews. Yeah? And Athens goim. Jerusalem. Hillary Clinton is a total Jerusalemite. Remember her basket of deplorables. Yeah? This is a chosen night classic expression. What is the problem with progressives? And I believe, are, are there any people here who see themselves as progressives? Don't be afraid. <laughs> progressives, progressive, for sure. Why? Because you understood that to be a progressive is to be a chosen knight. If I'm progressive, it means that someone else is reactionary. This is why progressiveness is so attractive for Jews. They take the chosenness into a new realm. Okay? The problem that we have in America is that we don't think at all. I gave this talk two days ago, three days ago, two days ago, three days ago, three days ago in Denver. And there was a very clever young boy, student, and he studied in a good college, and I don't remember what it was. 
but everybody kind of knew it's kind of really a, a good liberal college. And he said that the moment he, during his studies, first year or second year, he got to the point that he realized that answer B is the right answer, but answer C is what he's supposed to write. It was a very shocking moment for him in his development. This is America. You have the truth, you know the truth, but you say something different. Now, we go back to this idea of Lyotard. What we have to do now is to learn to unveil the shame to uproot the shame, each of us, the one of the most important thing that I learned myself is that one of the problems that we have in our society is that in the West we are always obsessed with the primacy of the I. In fact, the way I learned to do it, I actually self-reflect. I, study, I, I learned a lot from the Je Austrian philosopher Otto Weininger. Otto Weininger says in, you like Otto Weininger? In this book you have the best chapter on Otto Weininger. Otto Weininger was a German, uh, Austrian philosopher, <laughs> very unique. He killed himself by age of 21 or 22. He wrote a, a book that was the most influential book until World War II, but then they didn't like him because he was an anti-Semite, but because he was a Jew. It's, it's a great story. Otto Weininger realized that in art, self-realization is realization of the world. Artists look into themselves. They understand what is happening out there. They make a painting and then, wow. They make a poem and you understand everything. The other day I read a poem by uh, Mazin Kumsiya. You know, it, <laughs> it's very good Hebrew, you know. I, sh I was shocked. I, uh, apparently someone translated it. It, it was a good translation. We lost our ability to see things through art. And it's not very surprising when you see how arts look now. Thanks to who? All right? We have to bring back... Athens, beauty, where you look at a building and you feel the sublime, which is something that was so strong in America. All of that is gone. The best thing that you had in America, the best things that you had in America came from Athens. You had great universities. You had freedom to talk, exchange. First Amendment, land of the free. What is left out of it? You have to communicate in, grave, in graveyards, as we heard before. And even then, the J and, 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 and even then, the JVP and Antifa are trying to stop you. You have to learn to call a spade a spade. This is constitution, constitutional for you. The truth is there. It is crying to be unveiled. Waiting for us. Thank you. Questions? I have a question about the embassy in Jerusalem. You know, when Trump says he's going to do it, um, I thought. I thought actually the Orthodox rabbis and whatnot would be the most opposed to it because won't they, you know, because the embassy is like U.S. territory. And so you're going to have U.S. territory in the middle of Jerusalem. And it's different laws. And so it's like it's going to be an oasis, you know, potentially. I think that uh, you, 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 <laughs> you already. Uh, Jerusalemified, <laughs> you think well, like more Jewish than the Jews. One of the most interesting thing, and you remember the joke that I told you yesterday. I'm not sure that I want to do it in front of camera, despite the fact that it's a Jewish joke. 
they are very, very, they adapt very quickly. Okay? So, if it's not good for the Jews, what, in, 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 in the Jewish universe, what is good for the Jews is good. So, Hitler was very bad for the, for the Jews, you know, they agreed with it. Then Benjamin Netanyahu got really pissed off, really angry, sorry, with the Palestinians. He pulled the Holocaust on the Mufti of Jerusalem. They can reinvent their history, they can reinvent their uh, religion, they can reinvent the Talmud. When Zionism started, the entire rabbinical world was against it. It started to work, they joined in. Don't worry. <laughs> All right? Don't worry. They know how to deal with these issues. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you talked about the vocabulary that you used in Palestine now. Instead of right of return, it's, it's occupation, it's a checkpoint, it's a uh, uh, upper time. It's the, it, aren't they the same? Vocabularies are used here in the US like uh, games, like gays rights. Yeah. And quality and I don't know what's terminology, you know, but confusing everybody. Yeah. Is it the same creator that create those categories there? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean Absolutely. This is this is create those books about your oh yeah. Your child wearing like he's a boy. He he dress a pink dress off his game. Yeah. You gotta change his gender. Yeah. This is like Okay, so this is, this, is the, this is the issue. How did they do it? How did they do it to you? When did they start to divide you into, uh, into identi identitarian? When did you start to speak as a, when political correctness became the the realm in which kind of within you are exchanging. Do you remember? 60s? Okay, this is, this is an amazing thing because we, we remember the year, but do you remember how they did it to you? To me, it started, of course I'm old, but um, it started in the 70s, in the late 70s with the feminist movement is when the real change started to take place that I saw. And that was the birth. It came, and I do call that a Jewish movement, that women's, the, the, I think it's called the fourth, or whatever, called the women's movement, was um, a big change in this country. And it, was, it started to- You are right, you are right. So we can remember some kind of uh, anecdotal, just a second, anecdotal uh, insight. I looked into it, and I came to a conclusion that the guy that did it for all of you was Mr. Archie Bunker. <laughs> very, very clever project. Archie Bunker, I think it was Saturday night, 8 o'clock, kind of prime time. All, all in the family, for sure. Yeah. Every week on a routine operation, he attacks a different potential as a. The women, the gay, the... I went back to watch it. Fucking great. I, of course I'm right. If I wouldn't be right, they wouldn't like to stop me. You only try to stop people who are telling the truth. You know. Who was the author? A progressive Jew is still alive. I think his name is Norman Lear. Yes. Very clever boy. Now, yeah. Now this is fascinating. This is fascinating. Because at the time, you're struggling with Vietnam, and the CIA and the FBI realized that there are a lot of cells of communists students anti-war and they try to infiltrate into those bodies and they train all these agents and I spoke with a lot of people who were active in this and, and they said we were infiltrated and then Norman Lear 
is sitting at home in a posh kind of a New York and uh, with a printer, not a printer, with a kind of type, uh, typing machine, and got episode after episode, and he revolutionizes the way you think, he indoctrinate you into a new identitarian future while you are eating popcorn. And nobody understands it. For the next 20 years, in fact 30 years, I'm the first one to say, he is the guy. Uh-huh. All right. This is the old trick you asked me about. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. The old trick of terminological indoctrination is that it is smooth, it is going under your skin when you're having beer and your girlfriend having popcorn on your sofa in your comfort zone. This is genius. You cannot take it away from him. The question is how do we deal with it? Unfortunately, I don't think that what I see from the right at the moment is offering any, any solution. And why? Because foolishly, they are falling into this terminology, identitarian terminology, rather than uniting us all together as beings. And I spoke the other day with an old Marxist. I said, Gilad, what you're talking basically is class politics. And I said, yeah, but I don't think that class can work anymore because we lost our class, ident class uh, identification because class was a labor-related notion. All right? So if we don't work, we don't even understand. Working class. We don't have working class. Yeah? In America, you never had people who wanted to identify as working class. This never worked. All right? So this is, this, is, this is the issue. They are very, very sophisticated. Look how they did it to the Palestinians. How stupid were the Palestinians to adopt this terminology that was introduced to them by people who are associated with the oppressors. Palestine is the only liberation discourse in the history of the universe where the discourse is the, of the oppressed is shaped by the sensitivities of the oppressors. Am I right? I am right. But this is changing now. And I take some credit. All right? Some Palestinians were upset with me because they knew that I can see it. So, for uh, let's say Ali Abu Nima, I was his discourse uh, of the other. I knew, I saw him naked. I, I mean, not, not for real. Um, all right? And I still see exactly what he's doing, him and Barghouti and others. And by the way, I'm sure that they are doing a lot of good jobs uh, on many fronts, but on the most crucial fronts, they helped to wipe the right of return. I'll tell you something amazing. I was touring in Germany on the 30th of October, of, 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 of March, which was the first uh, March of return uh, in, in, in Gaza. I got to the room at 2 o'clock and I had to leave at 3 o'clock. I said, I will look what, because I, I was really kind of, uh, you know, what is going to happen. It was frightening because Israel was prepared and there, a lot of people died. And I said, I will check out if there is anything on electronic intifada tomorrow, not tomorrow, it's like already in, in four, three, four, five, six hours, there is a huge shift, something that has never been done in Palestine, and this is electronic intifada. Are, is it, are they going to report about it? And it, there was nothing, and I took screenshots of the, the entire site and published it. This is how we do it. I know that you want to ask a question. We, one of the reasons that we don't move anywhere is because the simplest way to topple, to interfere with the truth is 
to set control the position. And nobody is better in control of position than the Jews. If Jews, and this is something that I spoke about in Portland three or four years ago, when Jews understand that this is, Jewish, this is a Jewish problem, they accept that this is a Jewish problem. Palestine is a Jewish problem now. Everybody can see what the Israelis did in Palestine. The Israelis, Jewish snipers. Yeah? Ja Palestine is a Jewish problem. Hollywood. Some Jews accept that Hollywood is a Jewish problem because all this kind of that, and now in Harvey Weinstein, sexual predatory. Uh, what is his name? Uh, curb your enthusiasm. Larry David. Larry David stood up and said, oh, the reason why is there Jew, it's all Jews. You know, Jeffrey Epstein and Shmeffrey yeah, Epstein. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of things that can be Jewish problem. Hollywood, media, control of the media, Palestine, and so on and so on. The Jews accept to themselves. When this happens, when Jews themselves see that there is a problem, something appears on the scene. It's called satellite descent. So if this is Palestine, this is JVP. And if it's capitalism, this is Karl Marx. And if this is neoconservatism, um, what is the name? Aris. Uh, what is the name of this uh, neocon? Um, never mind. This will be. This will be uh, Chomsky, JVP. Um, yeah. If this is media, this will be democracy later. Uh, democracy now. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Goodman. All right. All right, now, this is, not con this is not conspiratorial. If you, uh, you, are, you see yourself as a Jew and you see what is happening in Palestine, say, listen, I cannot take it. I'm a Jew, I cannot take it. If you see what is happening with Goldman Sachs and blah, 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 Lehman Brothers, I don't know. Oh, I'm a Jew, I cannot take it. I'm, I'm, my name is Karl Marx and you're all going to be Marxist. All right? This is not necessarily, it could be conspiratorial, but I, I, I cannot say that it's conspiratorial. And they start to fight. And when Jews fight, it's great. It's unbelievable. I saw how the guy from the anti fast spoke with me. I, I, I told him, listen, just show me where did I criticize Jews as a race, as a biology. Hey, soul! You know, I said, no, this is not what I meant. Where? Where? Not, 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 you know, not. It, so I, I looked, I looked, I looked, I, I, kind of, I, I stand over a mirror to see, you know. Unbelievable. Anyway, when they start to fight, what you do, rather than joining in, you set a new parameter, a new, a new, uh, a new orbit, and you kind of form a new theater, and you watch them fighting. You don't get involved, because if you get involved, you become anti-Semites. If you get involved, we may have a Holocaust kind of every two weeks. It's a lot of work, you know, the schlepping and the that. You look at it. You, the outcome is that the entire American, British, French, political, spiritual, intellectual discourse is now an internal Jewish debate. Palestine is an internal Jewish debate. Neocon wars is an internal Jewish debate. If Jews find tomorrow that global warming is a, is a, they are blamed for global warming, you will have uh, Jews, uh, Jews against uh, global warming. And then it will be an internal Jewish debate. People, I talk a lot to people 9-11. 11 Israel, I said, if Jews, once Jews start to, to feel, and it already happened, that they are part of the problem, you will, have, you will find Jews for, a, there will be kind of a portion of a JVP move to take care of the 9-11, Jews for 9-11 truth. <laughs> All right? This is how they do it, and this is control opposition, and basically you are pushed out from engaging in the most relevant issues to your existence. Okay, sorry, man, it took time.
say with, with the Archie Bunker, uh, and to expand on that, also, he had, Norman Lear had two spinoffs from that show, two good, really good spinoffs, which was Maud, which has been the feminist, the women's movement, pushing that, and then the Jefferson, which is the black yeah. identity. Which is was the extension of, uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that was a big influence in my life, too, as a young 12. No, no, for sure. Yeah. Uh, me, too. Me, too. I saw it. I saw it. Um, in Israel, and uh, I don't know how my how my brain works, you know. I, the one thing that I hear all the time, you can see that my ideas are very simple, am I right? And when I, people read my books, they say, you know, it's amazing because we kind of knew it all, but we never managed to articulate it. This is, I think, my kind of... <laughs> I, I don't know how to change light bulb, but this is something that I do good. I can I can do well. I kind of know how to articulate some things. I'm, I kind of some a person told me about interconnectivity. I kind of start to look into a, a question, and then I find that it's Archie Bunker. It was some somewhere here, you know. And when I speak to Americans, I say, oh, "Yeah, man, you're right. You're right." Because Americans, and I I did it many times, especially when I wrote I wrote a book, like you know. I ask Americans, where, how did they do it to you? You all know that you are dominated by identity and nobody can point at it. Because it wasn't a transition, nobody had to push for it. It was cultural manipulation. And this is what we call cultural Marxism. The ADL and the South Poverty Law Center, the term that they ate the most is cultural Marxism. Now what cultural Marxism? Cultural Marxism is, is there to suggest that the revolution of our uh, of the world and our society, the way we, we, we see it, is not a material project. It is something that is done through cultural manipulation. That's it. <laughs> you know, if they don't allow you to talk about a term, if JBP said, don't say it, which is what they tell me all the time, you know that the truth is there. Con unconscious is the discourse of the other. Question. I've got a question. I, I have thought about this on identity politics, <laughs> even before I read your book, so I was really shocked that I wasn't the one in the world who thought of identity yes. uh, politics in that way. But um, another thing that I see is, as a Jewish project, is the um, what I call the sacred victim that is in criminal justice today, where um, like, for instance, sex offenses and that are expanded. You know, we've got uh, in this country for registration of people that are on the sex offender registry, some of them, have, uh, you know, teenagers. We, I, one person had an 11-year-old child, I think. It's amazing. They're, they never can ever be forgiven. And it's like the victim, if they point the finger, they're automatically guilty. There's 95 to 97, it's 94 to 97 percent of every mass trial in this country. 95 to 97? 94 to 97 percent of criminal cases in this country never have a trial. Yeah. They have a, a plea agreement, which is a coerced plea agreement, all the powers in the prosecutors. Yeah. And I just see that as part of, I don't know if it's APAC that's been part of this move. I even talked to, in Portland, I talked to um, a detective, and he said that we've always had laws, you know, that protected, what, you know, to take this and categorize this particular group as a separate type of specialty crime. Yeah. And never have and, and treat it totally differently than any other crime. Yeah. Seems kind of strange. And besides registering, you know, registering a person as an uh, outcast in society just seems strange to me. And now, of course, in this country, it's increased to nine different types of registrations besides yeah. sex offenses. Yeah. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah, as we know, there is a privatization of the of uh, um, policing in this country. There is privatization of the detention uh, uh, system. Um, this is the real meaning of hard 
capitalism that has got to the point of total detachment from the people. Now, I obviously believe uh, that equality is very important, but I also understand the capitalist argument. Cap capitalism can work, can work if it provides a lot of work. What happened to us is that once we were subject, the national ethos collapsed and Wall Street was free to invest wherever it wants because it's, it's, it's a money-making machine. They stopped investing in Detroit, in any other uh, cities, and they started to, 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 to buy and sell in China. Now, funny, interest, funny enough, the guy that warned us all about it was Mr. Henry Ford. That did it in 1922. He said, capitalism is made of banking and manufacturing. Banking can be very, very dangerous, and he called them the international Jews. And he said, we have to make sure that they are working with us, but they don't necessarily want to work with us. They want to work where they, get, they have money. He told us that it would happen, that society would move into, the capitalism would, would, capitalism would move into a, 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 a heavy duty globalization. Now, a country that doesn't produce anything, how does it make a living? How do, how do we do it? Services. Services, okay, but at a certain stage, at a certain stage, people don't have the money, they, okay. So what do we do next? What do we do next? We start to sell the land. We start to sell the land, and again, and again, and again, and again. How do we do that? Immigrants. In a second. We have a lot of, we need immigration. Immigration, after, even if they, 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 they get the lowest kind of accom accommodation, we start to see people kind of going up the ladder, and so on, and so on. Now, and, uh, for sure, uh, there is a, a, a lot, a, yeah. And then we start to make detention center into business. And then we make policing into, and even criminality become, biz, become business. It's very, very frightening. And this is instead of making cars. We should make cars, no jails. We should, because you still like to drive from place to place. You have to make cars, and if you buy an American car, it costs you X money, and if you want to buy a Japanese car, sorry my friends in Japan, or Chinese car, which maybe is at the moment slightly better, you pay 10 times more. You will all go back to drive Dodge and Buick and uh, Cadillac and uh, I don't know. Sorry. Well, you know, there are certain terms that people are terrified to use today. You were uh, talking today about several of them, obviously the word Jew and maybe several others, but. The one that uh, I find on the same level of fear and, and trepidation to mention is, is, the, uh, is the phrase National Socialism. And I've studied a little bit of history to know that back in the 30s in Germany, uh, between the, uh, I think the years 1933 to 1939, there was the five or six miracle years they talked about where labor and industry with a controlled banking system produced wealth for the people. Uh, prosperity and so forth, and, and that's not the only thing that's important in society, but it's funny that uh, a mix of uh, the proper kinds of economics where nationalism, such as America first, and socialism, which is regulating capital for the uh, capitalism for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of labor and industry, that mix of, 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 of substances makes for a powerful economic political system. What's your Okay, and, and this is, we have to finish soon because we have to clear it at, at nine, yeah? Yes. Uh, okay, so basically I, I write, one of the criticism that this book receives is that I actually, did you read this book? I did. You, you, so you, you know that I'm not, uh, I'm not afraid of dealing with national socialism because I say if global capitalism is a disaster and it is a disaster, it is a disaster. Maybe the answer is, I should say, 
socialism within the context of nationalism, but this is national socialism. We cannot lie. Now, I say national socialism wasn't a problem. The problem wasn't that the Italian, the idea, the original idea of fascism, Italian fascism, was equality of the Italian people. This is not a big problem. Then we had German Nazism that was, and this is not how you learn it in, in, Engl in England or in America, was the quality of the German-speaking people. Once you understand that this was the case, you understand that the Anschluss of Austria was because they were speaking German. And the issue with, uh, uh, with Czechoslovakia yeah, was because they were German-speaking people. Yeah, they're Germanic, but it wasn't necessarily the race. Then Hitler came along and said, equality of one race. Now, equality of one race is a very problematic concept because if you don't belong to the right race, you have an issue, which is exactly the issue that Palestinians had. And, you know, equality of one race is exactly the idea of labor Zionism that was racist nationalist. Racist National Socialism. Okay? Now, so I do believe that equality within territory is a brilliant thing. And as a matter of fact, if you see the recovery speed rate in Germany between 33 to 36, it is astonishing. And the same happened in Italy. And by the way, some people say that there is a, a, the, the, the five-star movement, it's kind of the return of that dream. And I'm not uh, qualified to talk about it because I'm not uh, an expert of Italy. It's something that is qu quite new to me, you know. They say Pepo Grillo is kind of interesting guy, but I, realize, I didn't realize that he wants to be the Duce. And I don't even know if this is the case. Uh, but somebody shared with me this kind of a new theory. Anyway, so I do believe that in order to save ourselves, we must start to look after each other. And it's quite, it's not easy to do it with people like uh, Antifa, you know, because you don't even know who they are, because with the, you know, with the, but, but, but they obviously cannot take care of themselves. So we'll have to take care of them for a while. This is the only way to do it. And uh, I realize why it is so frightening for people like George Soros and why they fund all these identitarian groups that are there to divide us. But I think that by now, the truth has already unveiled its face, its ugly face, really. And this is why we are here today, because we are concerned. <coughs> but we are still coming here because we think that we can fix it, and we can fix it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I gave you, I, I gave, to, <laughs> thank you so much. I gave a kind of a talk today, kind of explained to you uh, the, the issue with my uh, legal uh, course and blah, blah, blah. I hope that it was interesting. It was really the first time that I spoke about it. It was kind of an inter uh, interesting uh, concept, yeah. because I may have to start to talk about it to the press soon. Um, but um, um, really, even if you have the books or my CDs, I'm, I'm a great saxophonist. I mean, I, mean I, I, never, I never seen me in a concert because every, every, time, every night I have a gig, uh, 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 every night I, I cannot go to see, my, to see myself because every time I want to see myself, I'm already busy. <laughs> All right? Yeah, it's, it's complicated. Anyway, no, no, no. So, so, uh, so um, it will be great if you buy. I, I feel this is the best way to donate to my cause buy CDs, books, even if you have them, give them to a friend. We'll spread the, we'll spread the ideas and we will win. Thank you so much.